Hey guys, today we'll talk about another aspect of LDOs with off-chip capacitors called short circuit protection. So let's start with the problem. Let's say we are designing a 1.8 volt LDO with 1 microfarad of off-chip capacitor, 2.5 volt of input voltage and a maximum drive capability of 100 milliampere. Now let's consider the startup of this LDO. It's reasonable to assume that output voltage starts as zero. So that means we have a very large voltage at the input of a high gain amplifier. And this large input will cause amplifier output to rail and in this case to the ground rail. So that means we have maximum possible gate to source voltage across our power PMOS. Now consider for the moment how you size this power PMOS. You would size this power PMOS to provide 100 milliampere of current in your worst PVT corner while still remaining in the saturation or at the edge of saturation. That means in normal operation of this LDO, the lowest this node will go is about 1 volt. What all this implies is that if you apply 0 volt at the gate of this power transistor, the current through it can be much higher than 100 milliampere. In fact, for the best PVTs, this current can be as high as 1 ampere. In fact, this current has a name and it is called inrush current. Now this large inrush current can have couple of adverse effect in your design. Your input rail may not simply be able to supply this large surge of current and it may cause input rail to droop and in some cases catastrophically so. This input rail may be going elsewhere in the system and the droop may cause problem there. The other problem is that the metallization in your power PMOS may not be able to sustain the large currents. So either you have to massively over design your metallization or risk the meltdown. Now, apart from large inrush current, there is another problem because of the off-chip capacitor. Because of the fact that this capacitor is off-chip, you have a pin hanging there which is exposed to the messy external world. It is quite possible for this pin to be accidentally shorted to the ground. It is perfectly possible for this cap to be faulty and create a short to ground. And we don't want to melt our device if these kinds of accidents happen. Now, to protect the device from large inrush current or accidental shorts, these kinds of circuits have inbuilt protections, which is called short circuit protection or overcurrent protection. So let's see how these protection circuits work. There are several techniques to implement short circuit or overcurrent protections. In this video, we will consider two such techniques. One is purely analog technique and other is a mix of analog and digital. The operating principle of both techniques is quite simple and similar. We first need a way to sense the overcurrent condition and then use that information to regulate the current. So let's first consider the analog technique. In this technique, we directly sense the current of power transistor and then use that in a negative feedback loop to regulate the maximum current of this transistor. We can use a small replica device to sense the current in power PMOS. This replica device is usually quite small as compared to the power device. For our example, let's consider a 10,000 to 1 ratio. That means in normal operating condition, the maximum current through sense device would be 10 microampere. Now, in order to implement a negative feedback, we need a reference and an error amplifier. Now, in principle, we can choose both voltage and current as a reference, but in most cases, current is chosen as a reference. And we can very easily make a current comparator out of two current sources. Here if IREF is greater than current in M sense, then the voltage would be low and if M sense current is greater than the IREF, then voltage would be high. In normal operating condition, we would like current in M sense to be smaller than IREF. So this voltage would be low. On the other hand, in an overcurrent condition, the current in M sense exceeds the IREF and this voltage tends to go high. And when that happens, we would like to clamp the VG so that the current in power PMOS does not go above a certain value. We will use a PMOS to clamp the gate voltage. In order for this clamp PMOS to turn on, its gate voltage needs to go low. But recall that in overcurrent condition, this error amplifier voltage goes high. So we need an inverting state between this clamp PMOS and this error amplifier. Our circuit is now functionally complete. In normal operating condition, this voltage is low. Inverting stage is off, so amp clamp is also off. That means this circuit doesn't interfere in normal operating condition. But in overcurrent condition, 
this voltage goes high, the inverter stage turns on and M clamp clamps the VG. That means it stops VG to go all the way to the zero. Now this operation looks quite simple, but there are some subtleties here. The first is that in overcurrent conditions, there are now two loops which are trying to control the VG. The first is our voltage loop and second is the newly added overcurrent protection loop. In order to make sure that overcurrent protection does indeed limits the current, we need to make sure that when it is operational, overcurrent protection is able to overcome the normal voltage loop. When amp clamp is trying to pull up the VG, the error amplifier will try hard to pull it down. So we need to make sure that drive of amp clamp is higher than the drive of the output stage of error amplifier. Now what does it mean for our output voltage? Now since our main loop which is the voltage control loop is no more effective, the output voltage will collapse. In fact that is how the overcurrent protection loop protects the device. It trades the voltage regulation for the max current regulation. The second point to consider is stability. Recall that overcurrent protection is a negative feedback loop and any negative feedback loop has a potential to become unstable. Let's count total number of gain stages in overcurrent protection loop. The comparator branch is a high gain branch. So pole at this node would be a significant pole. The inverter stage is a low gain stage because of this diode connected transistor over here. So pole at this node would be a high frequency pole. That means it is unlikely to cause problem in loop stability. The final stage is again a high gain stage. This is because clamp is a common source transistor and hence high impedance transistor. And output stage of amplifier is also likely to be common source stages. Also in order for overcurrent protection to work, these two stages needs to be high impedance stages. If any of the two is low impedance stage, then it will interfere with the other loop. So we have two high gain stages in overcurrent protection loop. That means there are two significant poles. And recall that even though technically a purely two stage amplifier can never be unstable, but it has a potential to have a very low phase margin. And that means we need to compensate this loop. Now in principle we can make any of the two significant poles a dominant pole, but in practice we don't want to disturb our main voltage loop. So we make the comparator output node dominant. A dominant pole compensation technique works very well with this kind of loop. Finally, let's look at the source of inaccuracies in this loop. One source of inaccuracy is the mismatch between these transistors. It is not usually a good current mirror. Also in this implementation, the drain voltages of these two transistors is not same. Another big source of error is the accuracy of IREF itself. Any on-chip generated current has the variation because of the on-chip resistor. And variation in on-chip resistor can easily be plus or minus 15 to 20 percent. So combining these error sources, the overall error can easily be 30 to 50 percent. So if our maximum operating current is 100 milliampere, we don't want OCP to turn on within this range. We want OCP to start at a higher current, say around 150 milliampere. So OCP current drain can easily be 150 milliampere to say 250 or 300 milliampere. And that means even though your operating current is 100 milliampere, the metallization in power transistor should be able to take 300 milliampere. But still it is much better than 1 ampere which it would have to be without OCP loop. Before moving to the next technique, some practical advice on how to do the AC analysis. In order to do the AC or stability analysis, you need to put the loop in overcurrent condition. One way to put is to put a literal short circuit current at the output. But putting the ideal current source at the output is not the best way. Because if the short circuit current that you have put is not the right value, you may see very unrealistic voltages at the output. A better way to do it is to put a short circuit resistance. Or better yet, you can put an ideal voltage source at the output. If your target output voltage is say 1.8 volt, then put a voltage which will definitely cause the short circuit condition, for example, 1 volt. Okay, where to break the loop? Since there are two loops, you want to break the loop at the common point. And common point is the gate of the power transistor. Just make sure that the clamp is connected before the break. 
Okay, now let's look at the digital or mixed signal short circuit protection techniques. In this technique, we have an under voltage lockout or UVLO comparator on LDO output. If LDO output is less than a predefined threshold, then the output of this comparator is high, otherwise it is low. Now if UVLO output is high, that means Vout is lower than a certain threshold, then we disable the main loop. We put output stage at a predefined current. Only when the LDO output is higher than a certain value, we enable the voltage control loop. Okay, how does it help in startup condition? During startup, output voltage is likely to be low. So we do not enable the voltage control loop, but charge the output through a fixed current. And this way we limit the startup current. How about short circuit condition? A short condition will cause output voltage to droop. And this droop will trigger the UVLO. And again, when that happens, we put the output stage at a fixed current. So what are the advantages of this technique? One advantage is its design simplicity. We don't need to worry about the drive strength or the stability. It is also potentially a low area solution. UVLO comparators are almost always present with the LDO anyways. So what we need additionally is this current mirror branch and some additional logic. Also, we don't need to make this current higher than our operating current. We can very well keep it lower than our operating current. Okay, how about the disadvantages? It is essentially a voltage sense loop. So we don't know at which short current this V out will go below the reference voltage. So essentially we need to rely on simulations to find that value. So we have another source of error on the top of the existing sources of error. Now I've seen both of these techniques being used in actual chips. Which techniques you choose depends on your overall chip constraint. If you are short on design time or area but can tolerate some variation in short circuit current then digital technique is a solution for you. Or else go for the analog solution. That is more fun to design as well. That is if your idea of fun is designing complex analog circuits. Okay, that is all for this video. I need to make another video to address the off-chip components and their associated parasitics. So post your comments below and thanks for watching.